This morning, we're going to look at how to be a Great Commission Christian. Back in um, 2020, whenever we celebrated the 150th anniversary of Concord Baptist Association, our executive board made the recommendation and the messengers approved in 21 because of COVID and all that good stuff. The change of our name, now we didn't change the, who we are, our legal name or anything, but now we, we go by Great Commission Baptist Association. And that's because we realize that after 150 years, while our mission has not changed, it's a whole lot easier for people to understand what our fellowship of churches is about when we say we are the Great Commission Baptist Association of the River Valley rather than Concord. Now, 150 years ago, that Concord was around the gospel we preach. And our churches knew that. And if you've watched True Grit, the second edition, you know that's how everybody in Fort Smith talked back then. But today, we, we have found that it is important to be very clear that we are about the Great Commission. So we want to look and say, what does that mean to be a Great Commission Christian? I want to pray for us, and then we're going to look at some very familiar passages to see what it is that God expects out of those who would fulfill the Great Commission. Grace, Heavenly Father, we come to your presence. Father, I thank you so much for these that are gathered here, Lord, for those that are listening on Facebook. Father, I thank you for the incredible privilege of getting to fill this pulpit. I do not take it lightly. Father, I thank you for, for Mike, for his ministry, for his love for you, his love for your word, and for the incredible job he's done as your under-shepherd here at Rye Hill. Father, I ask this morning that you would open our hearts and our minds that we would hear from you, or that your Holy Spirit would delve deep into us, convicting us where we need to, encouraging us where we need it. Father, most of all, inspiring us to lift up, honor, and glorify Christ in all we say and all we do. Father, whatever I say that is useful and edifying and encouraging for your church, I pray it will be taken to heart. Lord, if I say anything that, uh, Lord, if I say anything amiss, I pray it'll be forgotten before anyone walks out the door today. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now, obviously, if we're going to look at the Great Commission, I'd be a Great Commission Christian. Open your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, the 28th chapter. We're going to be in three familiar passages today. We're going to be in, in Matthew's Gospel, the 20th chapter, the Great Commission. We're going to be over in Matthew 22, the Great Commandment. And then we're going, to, we're going to spend a limited time in Micah, Micah 6, 8, looking at the great requirement. Let's begin with the Great Commission. The Great Commission says, and I, normally I use CSB, but I'm going to use New King James because it's right there and it's in big print and I can read it. The scripture says, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, they say teaching them to observe, everything whatsoever I've commanded you. And remember, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Folks, this is the Great Commission. Baptists have cut their teeth on this verse. I imagine that for most of you, after you learned John 3.16, you learned the Great Commission. Let's think for a minute, what does it mean to fulfill the Great Commission? First of all, it means that we're going to make disciples by sharing the gospel. And we're going to tell everyone, go therefore and make disciples. When you make a disciple, what you're doing is you're leading someone to put their faith, their trust in Jesus Christ when they repent of their sins. Now, the gospel, very, very simply, and I want to give you the, the 10,000 foot view of the gospel from Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, the scripture tells us, Paul says to the church at Corinth, he said, I passed on as of first importance what also I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, was buried, and God raised him from the dead according to the scriptures. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But you notice how he said twice in there, according to the scriptures. If you go all the way back to Genesis, the gospel, the, the gospel big is this. God is the creator of everything that is. The sovereign, eternal God spoke everything that is into existence. He created man and woman, Adam and Eve, to be his image bearers in this creation, to give him glory, to fellowship with him, to love him, 
That, that was why humanity was created. But in the garden, the scripture tells us the fall came when man decided they wanted to have their way. First, Eve, then Adam said, no, God, we want to trust us. We want to be in charge. We want to be in control. And they rebelled. They disobeyed the one command that God had given. And because of that, sin entered into the world. And there was a separation between man and God, and man could not bridge that gap. So Jesus Christ, second person of the Trinity, eternal God, creator of all that is, he left heaven's glory. Philippians tells us that he, that he set aside all that was his by divine right. And John tells us he put on flesh and blood and became a man, eternal God, came as a babe in the manger, lived a sinless, perfect life, then died as the Lamb of God, our substitute. Laid in the grave for three days, and then God raised him from the dead to say, the debt has been paid. And if, in repentance and faith, we acknowledge that God is creator, we admit that we are sinners. We acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the only sacrifice for our sin, and we give control of our life to him. Romans 10 says, by saying, Jesus is Lord. And the scripture tells us we'll be saved. John 1 says it this way, to them who believe gave he the right to be called the children of God. Folks, that's the gospel. That is it. That is what we live for. That's what we depend on. That is why we can sing a song that says, I will rise. And our job is to proclaim that message, that hope we have to all the world. I went to lunch, or I went to breakfast Friday with a friend, with a new friend, a guy I met whenever we moved downtown for a little while. Became my neighbor, and I uh, call him John. And, and uh, I mean, I love, he's a, I love him to death. He, is a, he was a great neighbor. It's fun to talk to. He is, he is a progressive. He would style himself as a democratic socialist, which cracks me up. He lives in Fort Smith, Arkansas. So he is a minority of three. I mean, that's just crazy, right? Okay, he, 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 I mean, he's had a, a crazy life. We, we talk about everything under the sun. And he would say today that, that he considers himself to be an agnostic. Okay, well, man, that's just, I love him. He's a good friend. So we meet now that I've moved. We only get together about every four to six weeks. And then we'll talk about football. We'll talk about politics, which is just always a fun walk in the park as we probably don't touch on two things we agree on. And yet we'll get down and at some point we'll talk about Christ. We've probably had over the last four or five years, I bet we've had a dozen or more really serious gospel conversations where what I just shared with you, I've shared in, in whole or in part with him. So as we were coming back after breakfast, we'd, we'd been covering a lot of ground. And I said, John, I said, what do you think I believe someone has to do to go to heaven. I wanted to see whether or not, whether or not I was being heard. And he said, well, he said, man, that's hard. He said, uh, he said, tell you what. He said, here's what I think. He said, he said, I think you believe God's creator. He's like, so far so good. And he said, and, and you need to try to do all the good stuff he wants you to do to go to heaven. That's bad. Folks, I, trust me when I say I've done my very best to communicate the gospel. So I said, well, he said, is that it? And I said, well, it's close, but not really. And so we, we talked a little bit more about 1 Corinthians. Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. I said, it comes down to this, John. I said, yeah, God is creator, and that's why he has the right to say what is sin. I said, but here's the thing. It's not the doing good works. Ephesians says that, that we are saved by grace through faith, but why? What does verse 10 say? Because God has created good works for you to walk in them. What does James say? James is this blunt as all get out. James says if you have faith and no works, you've got a dead faith. So yes, it's important that we live in obedience. But folks, what saves us is not obedience is what saves us is that Christ is Lord and we're following Him and that He is our Savior and we know our only way to take care of our sin problem is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. We share that. And I, I shared that story to say this to you. 
Sometimes we think if we toss out a track or if we say it once, they're supposed to have gotten it. But folks, the world we live in has so much noise. And so much of the world equates Christianity with being good and being Republican. That, that, that somehow that's going to save you. Just FYI, it don't. You can be a Republican all you want to be. You can vote as conservative as you want to go, and you'll split hell wide open without Jesus Christ. You hear that? All right. But the world, the world says, yeah, they just want to be good and tell everybody what to do. Folks, we've got to make sure that what they hear us say is that of first important, the most important thing in our life, where our hope is, where our foundation is, where our rock is, is that Jesus Christ, the eternal God, died on a cross for us, was buried and rose again. That's the gospel. Now, if we share that, and folks repent of their sin, they put their faith, their trust in Christ, they name Him as Lord, give Him control of their life, then the Scripture says they're to be baptized. That baptism does not save them. That baptism is the evidence, the testimony that it is that first expression of obedience to Christ where you identify with Christ. And what are baptism? I always pray that the waters of baptism are stirred as often as possible. And I'm even watching across the River Valley as people are becoming a part of the body of Christ. They're coming in. And then it says, as long as we forget this part of the Great Commission, it says, and teach them to obey everything whatsoever I've commanded you. Now back up, folks. That's a lot, isn't it? I mean, how do you do that? How do you, how do, you do that with somebody that's coming out of a lost background? They don't, they don't know anything. I am blessed. Susie and I are blessed with two beautiful grandchildren and one more that will be here in November. And uh, our little daughter, Aunt, our granddaughter, Anna, she's, uh, she's going to be seven in November. She's in first grade. But last year when her brother Judah was on the way, we, I pick her up on Thursday afternoons. We have a papa or yaya day, depending on what the case may be. We pick her up and we go to the nature center, run around, just have fun. And she will just jabber, 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 jabber. So I picked her up from kindergarten. She's five, almost six. She knows she's got this little brother coming and she looks up in the mirror from her car seat at me and she says, Papa, I'm going to get a brother. I said, I know, isn't it exciting? She said, yeah. She said, Papa, Papa, he won't know nothing. <laughs> she said, and she looked at me as only, as only a five-year-old can, and she said, Papa, he won't even know how to go to the bathroom. <laughs> she was just amazed that they were going to bring into the house this little creature that didn't know nothing. So I said, that's right. And then she looked at me, and she said, but Papa, it's going to be okay, because I know a lot, and I'll teach him. You know what? In that precocious little five-year-old way, you got it. You know what the church is? You know what we call each other brother and sister? Church is a family. And when God brings somebody into the family of God, when we are called a child of God, He puts us in a church. And yeah, you've got Brother Mike, you've got Cody, you've got Scott, You've got Steve, you've got a lot of staff members. You know what? Every believer here who has been a believer for a minute knows how to walk with Christ. And when a new, a new Christian comes in, they don't know nothing. They know Jesus is Lord. They know they're alive in Christ. But there's so much to learn how to do. And God said, I put you in a family so your brothers and sisters can show you how to live for me. Folks, that's the purpose of the church, to make disciples and to grow them to maturity and faith. We are to obey the Great Commission. But man, where do you start on these commands? I mean, all that Christ is, all that the Bible commands, where do you start? Well, I want to suggest that Christ gave us that place in Matthew chapter 22 when he gave the Great Commandments. Remember in chapter 22, the lawyers, they were coming, they were trying to trip Jesus up. They were trying to get him to say something that would just kind of make everybody mad. So they said, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And here's how he responded. He said to them, love the Lord your God 
with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Love God, love people. It's a great place to start, isn't it? We obey the great commandments. We say we are to love God and we are to love people. Well, all right. Brother Jeff, I'm a brand new Christian. I know I'm supposed to love God. I know I'm supposed to love others. How do I do that? Well, let's go back to Exodus chapter 20. What do the Ten Commandments say? Love God. You're to have no other gods before me. You're not to make for yourself any idol. You're not to take or call on my name in vain. You're to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. First four commands tell us how to love God. And then with that fifth commandment, there's a, a hinge and the commandments begin to tell us how to love others. First, with the family of our origin, when it says, honor your father and mother. You learn to love, to obey, to honor the parents God gives you. Then he says, you will not murder. You don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. It starts to talk as you grow and move out into community. How do you show your love for others? Well, these are the very basic minimum commands. What you'll discover is that every society that's ever been will have some variation of the Ten Commandments built on their heart because we know with echoes from eternity that we're to love God and love others. Know that, that last command, thou shalt not covet. You know what covetousness means? It means to desire, to want, to, to, to yearn for something that you have no rightful claim to. It says you not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant or his ox. It's saying if, if your neighbor has something that you have no legitimate claim to, don't, don't desire it, don't scheme for it, don't, don't envy it. When we were in the Philippines serving with the IMV with some missionary friends that did a lot of chronological Bible story. And um, there was, there was a, a lady that lived in one of the towns. She was uh, culturally Catholic, and she had a lot, of, a lot of tribal folks that had come out of the tribal regions that uh, were more animistic that would come in and work for her. And she wanted the missionary to come and, and, and share the gospel with them. So they were going through this chronologically from the very beginning on, and they got to the Ten Commandments. She's sitting there in the back, and she was just smiling and nodding, and they went through all the commandments about God and don't murder. She's just, yep, yep, done that, done that. Like that rich young man, she's just checking it off. And they got to covetousness, and she was, all right, all right. And then she decides, she said, she said, wait a minute, what is that? So missionary shared with her that desire. She thought about it for a second, and she looked at him, and she said this. Well, if that's true, we're all going to hell. Let's sink in for a minute. You know what the law does? The law shows us our sin. The law can't take care of our sin, but it shows us our sin. And the reality is, she, she hit it. She thought she was being good enough to go to heaven. And then she realized those envious thoughts, those are sin. We obey. The Scripture tells us, Corinthians, to take every thought captive to Jesus Christ. The folks, all of a sudden, this obey all he command gets bigger. And then, once they get that down, and that kind of starts to sink in, they go to, to Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus Christ laid us. You know what happens? Jesus starts with the Ten Commandments there in chapter 5, and he says, You've heard it said, Thou shalt not murder. But I say to you, anyone who's angry, who hates his brother, has murdered already his heart. You've heard it said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who looks with lust on a woman has committed adultery already at heart. Whoa, Jesus. Obeying all you command means not only do I have to, to do right, but I have to be right. My heart has to be right. It's not just my actions. 
It's my attitude. You know what that is? That is a reflection. When Jesus said that all of the law of the prophets hang on this, he was summing up. The prophets go deeper. The Word of God goes deeper than just an outward ritual. Look at Micah chapter 6, verse 8. We've looked at how we need to fulfill the Great Commission. We've looked at how we need to obey the Great Commandments. But we also have to fulfill Micah 6, 8, sometimes called the Great Requirement. Micah chapter 6, verse 8, the Scripture says, Mankind, He has told each of you what is good and what it is the Lord requires of you, to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. Our obedience is more than just our actions. It's our attitude. It's the posture of our heart. Okay, Rahil, hold on. It's going to get a little bumpy. Be just. You know, the, the prophets, were we there about the prophets? Were we there about, about prophecy? Most of the time, we think about foretelling. Y'all are going through, and I'm glad, man, your pastor's taking you through Revelation, and we're looking at prophecy, what will happen in times. We love to think about Daniel and how the weeks work, all that. But understand something. All of the message of the prophets, about this much was in times, and about this much, well over 95% of the message of the prophets, was about speaking the truth of God to people who were abusing power and being comfortable and satisfied. Micah sums up the message, not only the book of Micah, but the message of the prophets. Over and over again, they said, be just. What were they interested in? They were interested in not abusing the vulnerable. Biblical justice is this. Care for the poor, the widow and the orphan, and the stranger in the land. Over and over and over again. The prophet called the nation of Israel to task because they were taking advantage of the poor with usury, with, with loans that could not be paid, the payday loan kind of idea. Widows and orphans who were being left to fend for themselves when they had none to provide. The strangers in the land, the immigrant, legal or illegal, the image bearer of God that was your neighbor, that was in your community. Yes, there need to be laws, rules. I'm not talking about that, but I'm saying when you look at someone's face, you ask the question, has God in His providence brought them to me that I can show them the love of Christ and share the gospel of Christ? And if you're worried about anything else before that, stay after that, but if you're worried about anything else before that, you need to do a gut check. What do we mean? You say, well, Brother Jeff, there's, we live in America. It's the most prosperous land in the world. There's really nobody with any trouble. We live in Area 2, District 2, what it's called, here in Fort Smith, the River Valley. You realize back in, back in 2010, we had the second highest per capita foster care rate in the United States behind only the south side of Chicago. Folks, that don't have to be. I was talking to Derek Brown. He's the president of the, of the uh, Arkansas Families and Children's Homes. <clears throat> If 1%, listen to me, if 1% of the families that make up Arkansas Baptists would open their homes up to foster care, there would be a bed for every child needing one in the state of Arkansas. Do you hear what I said? And say if 1% of the people, I said if 1% of the families connected foster care and adoption, which is part of what the state convention does, we, we actually helped to sponsor and launch it right here in the River Valley to help get that idea started that they would take folks through foster care and all of that. 
Folks, there's need, not only families to foster, but extended family. You ever notice something? In our, in our families, a lot of the, right? And it's Susie right now with, with, our, with our grandson, Judah. Tyler works, Ashley teaches down at Greenwood, so they needed someone to watch. So Susie, they did not have to twist her arm very much, but she watches Judah during the day because we're grandparents, because we're at a place where we can do that, so we do do that. That's extended family. In the foster care system, not only do they need foster families and parents, but they need a church that will wrap around and say, you know what, we'll do some of the extended family stuff that's missing. Why is that important? Well, for me it's important because that that precious little girl I told you about that looked at me and said, I've got a brother coming. Five years ago, she went into foster care with Connected. And in that, Tyler and Ashley got to know her. He was working with, they fell in love with her, and they put in and they adopted her. And she's a part of our family now. And my heart breaks when I think, what happens when kids don't have somebody? What happens whenever they get turned back, whether it's to biological or affected family, and, and, and it's so dysfunctional and messed up, they can't care for them. Folks, the church, the church needs to say, we're going to live out the great requirement. We're going to seek biblical justice, whatever it may need to look like. And that is just one example in the River Valley where the church needs to respond and say, we can't do everything, but what we can do, we will do. And that's hard. That's more than just getting excited on a Sunday morning. That's day by day. That's having to go through all the different processes. And it's not easy. When kids come into foster care, they come into foster care because they've been traumatized. So a lot of the stuff that we think works natural doesn't work. Their poor little souls and brains have been so beaten down. They've, it takes a lot of patience. And then it says that we're to love faithfulness. Faithful love, that means that, that our faith is to be pure and true. That means that we're to be faithful to God above everything else. We have said, when we say Jesus is Lord, that means He is the highest priority in our life, and everything else comes in a very, very distant second. And sometimes it's real easy for us to say, oh, you know what? Those Israelites, those people in the ancient Near East and the Old Testament worshiping idols, they were such dummies. Folks, they weren't dummies. They built pyramid. You built a pyramid lately? I mean, they, they were smart. It, was not, it wasn't the idol of the wood they were worshiping. They felt like that, whatever it was. They felt like that it housed or it get them harnessed. The power of the spirit world to give them security and to give them safety and to give them all this stuff. So an idol, hear me, an idol is anything that you put more trust, more hope, more value in than Jesus Christ. And no, none of you have a little piece of wood sitting in your backyard that you go give fruit to every day. I know that. Does that mean we don't have any idols in the River Valley? No. Like I said, I hope you don't have open toe shoes because it's fixing to hurt again. I love football. Mike and I share a love for the OU Sooners. Last year was rough. This year's a whole lot better. But, but I'm, a, I'm a huge football fan. My boys both played for Greenwood, and man, we wasted just more Friday afternoons and nights doing I love to cheer. I love to scream. I love athletics. A lot of y'all are hog fans. We, we like to cheer. We like to get excited. Hear me. If you have more passion and excitement, about going to cheer for your team, then you have passion, excitement about coming to worship your Lord. You've made whatever that team or event is an idol. I'm not saying, I, I think you ought to be excited. I think you ought to go to games. I think you ought to cheer and be stupid and silly and all that. But if it gives you more joy than Jesus, you've let it have a place in your life it doesn't deserve. 
As long as I'm here, we may as well finish. If you have more trust, if you spend more time trying to convince your neighbor that they need to vote for Trump or whatever other candidate you have because that'll change the world and make us great again and all that, if you do more of that than you do telling people about the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ, if they know who you're going to vote for before they know who you depend on for eternity, guess what? You have just made your politics an idol, and you need to repent. Not say, I, I have voted in every election since I turned 18. I have incredibly deep and opinionated opinions about all things political. But you know how much hope I have in politics of any stripe, bringing about the hope of the nations? I got zip. I'm 57 years old. I've seen politicians my whole life. They are not going to lead us into the promised land. They are not going to solve a problem one. You know what they're going to do? They're going to get everyone excited and they're going to get everybody going. And that's fine. And you ought to. And you need to vote. And you need to vote your conscience. And you need to vote conviction. But if you're more excited and you're more of an evangelist for that than you are for Jesus Christ, then it's an idol and you need to repent. Why? Because we have some great requirements. And it says we are to walk humbly with our God. That means we are to realize God is God and we are not. That means that, that no matter what else is happening in life, our hope, our security, it's found in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And yeah, I want to have money in the bank. And yeah, I want to have health. And I want to have a family that works like it's supposed to and we're all excited. At the end of the day, I'm humble enough to know that all those things are by the promises and providence of God and not because of me. Folks, if you want to be a Great Commission Christian, you've got to try to fulfill the Great Commission. You've got to obey the Great Commandments. You've got to seek to meet the Great Requirements. And you need to be a part of a Great Commission church. The commands in Scripture, we, we are very individualistic as Americans. We love by our bootstraps. I don't know how many people I've talked to. They give me some variation. Cody, they'll say something like this. Well, I'm pretty spiritual, but I don't believe in religion. I don't go to church. I get it. Man, yeah, Churches can be bad, mean, all that kind of stuff. I get it. Right now, Cody will tell you, I'm kind of a statistics nerd. I'm, I'm nerdy that way. Right now, about a third of the United States and at least a quarter of the River Valley, they'll give some version of this and answer, I'm a very spiritual person, but I don't go to church. I'm a very spiritual person, but I don't believe in religion. Hey, if religion is just ritual, I'm, I'm with you. Here's the problem. Of all of the one another commands that are given in Scripture, well over a third of them require us to be together to do them. Think about what Hebrews chapter 10 says. It says, forsake not the assembling yourselves together. Why? Because we are to, first of all, we're supposed to have been encouraging and provoking one another to love and good works. We're supposed to be there to rejoice with one another. We're to mourn with one another. We're, we're to do so many things with one another, and you know what? You can't do that underneath the tree out in the deer stand being spiritual. I mean, you can do that, and you ought to, and if you're in the deer stand, I want you to be spiritual. But you can't obey all that Christ has commanded as a Lone Ranger, solo Rambo Christian. It doesn't work. You can try it. You can be all proud of it. But you know what? You're a disobedient disciple if you're a disciple at all, if that's what you're doing. Now, a Great Commission church is going to engage the lost with the gospel. The gospel is going to be the most important thing. I love Rye Hill. I love your pastor because that's his heartbeat. The Great Commission church is going to equip the saints. It is going to take those brand new babies in Christ and teach them how to rightly divide the word of truth, how to pray, how to witness, how to serve, how to minister. You're going to do that. And we're going to do it so imperfectly. Oh, we're going to do it so imperfectly. 
you know what? The scripture doesn't say that good works have to be perfection. It says it has to be our direction. I came to Christ as a 15-year-old boy in Dell City, Oklahoma. And all I knew was that I needed Jesus and I was going to give him control of my life as best I knew how. And I have tried to do it. You know what? When you're 15, there's a whole lot of life you haven't even thought about yet. But I was saying on the front end, Jesus, I'm going to give you control. I didn't even have a steady girlfriend. I was saying, Jesus, I'm going to let you show me how to be the right kind of husband and choose a wife. I sure wasn't thinking about kids, but I was saying, Jesus, I'm going to let you be in control of how I father and how I parent, and I'm going to let you help me raise my kids. I, I had worked, but I worked little bitty minimum wage jobs. I said, Jesus, I'm going to let you be in control of my career. And I got to tell you, that was a battle. Because being a preacher was the last thing on my mind. I was all about the money. And I figured out quick, that's bad choice. You know what, folks? I struggle with that kind of stuff. But over and over again, I was saying, Jesus, I want to be obedient to you and I want to honor you. And I messed up more times than I can count. But when I did, the Spirit would convict me. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we'll confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And little by little, I look more like Jesus. And folks, if you know me well, you know I still don't look like Jesus, like I ought to. But if you'd known me at 15, you'd say, but man, I can see the resemblance a whole lot more now than I did then. I promise you that. Here's what I'm saying. We come together. From now until the day we see Christ face to face, we are a work in progress. Individuals as a church. But a great commission Christian says, I'm going to do it by being obedient. I'm going to do it by meeting the great requirement, I'm going to do it by fulfilling the great commission and sharing the gospel with everybody God gives me an opportunity to. And as a church, that means that our goal is going to be to send great commission Christians. This is where it gets really tough. Where Rye Hill's been good. Great Commission Baptist Association, our goal, the purpose, the reason our churches are together. Cody will tell you this, I've grinded anybody's head every pastor's line. We want to see a healthy Great Commission Baptist Church for every thousand households in the River Valley. Because we know if we can do that, those churches will be able to make sure the gospel is shared with every person in the River Valley. We're not there. We're closer than we have been. We're doing better than a lot of people in other parts of the country, but we're still not there. And part of getting there is saying that our church, Rye Hill, is going to be about reaching the ends of the earth, Two boxes, but it's also going to be about reaching across the street to say, where do we need a new church? Or where does the church need to be revitalized and experience health again? You've done that over and over again. You did that at Temple. You've done that with the West Side. You're doing that over and over. You're doing that as you send people like Thurman as missionaries back to North Carolina with circumstances. You do that when you intentionally send people, but when you intentionally send your best. See, I've been around this game long enough to know a lot of churches say, man, we want to send some people to go help that church that's struggling. And then they say something along the lines of, we got a lot of folks we'd just soon not have. We'll let them have them, and we're going to shuffle them out the door. But you know what happened in Acts chapter 13 at the church at Antioch? Church at Antioch, vibrant, doing great, growing. When they prayed the Holy Spirit, they sent their best. They sent Paul and Barnabas to go. So hear me. One of the ways you can measure, are we living up to the Great Commission as the church? Is are you averaging about 1% of your best leaders leaving, not because they're mad, not because something's gone wrong, but leaving because the church says, we want you to go help, either plant a new church or have a sister church. It ends up being about 10% a decade. Y'all are probably doing that right now. Gosh, man, when you started, when I first came, Mike was here, y'all were less than 100. It was pretty easy to have 10% go. You just had to have one person every decade, and you were there. But now you're growing. Now you've got some great leaders. You know what? The day's going to come whenever you're going to need to say, you know what? God, we think you're going to send Cody and his beautiful family. We love him. We don't want to lose him. They do great. You're going to see the chitty. You're going to see people that you say, these are our best. And God's going to say, why don't you raise them? Because here's the thing, church. 
Families raise up their children to go out. I am proud of my two boys. When they were born, it terrified me and it thrilled me all at the same time. But folks, we know there's something wrong if when your children grow up to be adults, my boys are both toddlers fixing to turn 30. It was five, man. When they were in high school, yeah, they were there. They were eating our food and being there all the time. They were in college. They would come back and just raid everything. But when they got out and got on their own and began to have their own families, we love when they come back. We're blessed that they're both living here in the Fort Smith area. We get to see them a lot. But we know that won't last. That will move them. That's how it ought to be. Because unless something's gone wrong, unless there's been a crisis, Hell, finance something. Kids don't come back to stay. They come back to visit. You know what? In the church, if we're healthy, as these young people grow up and they go to college and they get out, we will send them. We will send them to grow the church. Because you know what? The seven churches of Asia Minor, all the churches you read about in Acts, they don't exist anymore. But the gospel does. The message does. Why? Because they raised up believers, and when God was ready, they were willing to send out. They didn't hold on. They were willing to send their best. Folks, I don't know where this message has hit you this morning, but we are going to land this plane. You're here this morning, and maybe for the first time, it's finally you finally heard I need to give Jesus Christ control of my life and repent of my sin. And this morning, you may need to respond by saying, I want Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. You've never followed the Lord in baptism. This morning, you may need to come, tell Cody and say, I want to follow in baptism and show that I belong to Jesus. It may be, we've gone over the great commandments, the great requirement, you realize God's calling you to greater maturity. He's calling you to greater service. You need to respond to that. Maybe that you're here and you've been attending for a while. And you've been kind of thinking, I can be all spiritual on my own. And you realize if I'm going to be a Great Commission Christian, I've got to belong to a Great Commission church. Right Hill's that kind of church. You may need to come today and say, I want to be a member, whether you're coming by letter from a sister Baptist church, or you're coming by statement, or you're coming by baptism. But you may need to say, you know what, it's time for me to not just be a guest, but to be a part. I don't know how God may be working in your heart. But in just a minute, we're going to stand, we're going to have a word of prayer. Go do invitation, right, Cody? Okay. We're going to stand, we're going to have a word of prayer. Cody and Scott are going to stand up here at the front. He's going to come back. We're going to sing a verse or two of something. As we do, the Holy Spirit's moving in your life, and you need to respond in a public way. Or if you just need to respond with a question about how to respond, I'm going to ask you to step out from where you are and come and say, Jesus, I want to be obedient to you. Let's stand together for a word of prayer. Grace, Heavenly Father, we come into your presence. Lord, we thank you for your grace in our lives. Father, we thank you the gospel, or Jesus Christ who died for us. If there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Father, I pray this morning you would draw them to yourself. Father, I know there are many here today that would say, yes, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. But they need to take a step of obedience, a step of faith, a step of saying, I want to grow more like Jesus. And to do that, I need to make a commitment. Father, whatever that commitment may be, I pray you draw this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.